You're watching The Daily Climate Show on Sky News. On today's programme, how sucking carbon dioxide out of the air could help the UK reach net zero. Space might be the final frontier, but will it cost us the Earth to get there? We hear if sustainable rocket fuel could be the answer. And the 10-year-old campaigning to ban plastic toys in children's magazines. Hello and welcome to the UK's only daily climate news show where we track the changes happening to our world right now and meet those coming up with the solutions. And some of those solutions will be put to the test as part of a major new trial looking at different ways to remove carbon dioxide from the air. Now, experts will study data from five projects testing the most effective ways to remove the greenhouse gas from the atmosphere. Well, in a moment, I'll be speaking to Professor Cameron Hepburn from the University of Oxford, who's coordinating the trial. But first, what is carbon capture? Well, let's bring in Cameron Hepburn, Director and Professor of Environmental Economics at the University of Oxford. Hello to you. Uh, tell us why these trials are important. Why do we need carbon capture? Well, they, they are really important. And I'm sure a lot of your listeners are thinking, we don't want to be sucking CO2 out of the air. We want to not be putting it up there in the first place. And in a sense, they're right. The first priority is to stop our emissions. But these trials are important because if we're going to stop warming above one and a half degrees, in addition to going as fast as possible, stopping our emissions, we've actually got to work out the cheapest, the most effective, the most socially attractive ways of sucking CO2 out of the air as well and storing it safely either in land or even under underground. So we need these trials to work out what we should do, not just in the UK to meet our own net zero targets, but globally. But is there a concern that if carbon capture's improved, companies will just employ that rather than cutting back on their emissions? No, I mean, that, that shouldn't be a concern in the sense that we don't have the space to not cut back on our emissions, as I say. I mean, we have to go full speed ahead on cutting our emissions. And even if we do that, you know, because we've left it so late to take action on climate change, we're going to have to do this as well. So th these are not choices. This is the most important thing to get across. And apart from anything else, there's only so much land on which you can plant trees uh, or, or peatland that you can restore. So we just we have to stop putting it up there in the first place. But, and on top of that, it's kind of stupid to be plowing vast amounts of money into a fossil system to put all this CO2 up into the atmosphere and then to spend a lot of money taking it back down again. So, so best not put it up there in the first place. But you know, as I say, we're going to have too much up there. We've got to find ways of taking it back down. Again. And how confident are you that we'll have viable and inexpensive carbon capture options in the near future? That's exactly what this trial is about. We're trying to work out uh, which of these methods that they, they look very attractive. That's why they've been funded. That's why we're exploring them. They look as though they could be pretty cheap in many instances. And they could work with the grain of agriculture, with the grain of nature. They could increase productivity. Uh, they could be beneficial for farmers and for landowners, but we've got to test these things out. We've got to make sure that you know, they do actually work, that they're monitored properly, that local people like them, that, that, that the technologies are advancing at the types of speeds that we need. So there's a lot of kind of ifs and buts, and that's why we need this study. And if it does work out that some or you know, at least one of these uh, processes works, then we want to scale it up um, globally in a way that's obviously sensitive to 
the needs of different people in different geographies. Professor Cameron Hepburn, thanks very much indeed. My pleasure. Thanks, Anne. And you can hear more about how innovative technology can help us fight climate change in this week's episode of Climate Cast, which you can listen to wherever you get your podcasts from. In today's other climate news, Ofgem says it's investing £300 million to expand the UK's electric vehicle charging network. The energy regulator said the funding will go towards more than 200 low-carbon projects to help the UK prepare for more electric transport. 1,750 charging points will be installed in towns and cities across the country. The government's being warned the UK will struggle to reach its climate targets unless more power is given to local leaders. The Mayor of Greater Manchester and Metro Mayor of Liverpool are amongst those who've written to Boris Johnson calling for faster action to protect the environment. They say local authorities should be given the money and resources to make the changes needed to meet the net zero targets. The Environment Agency will use low-carbon concrete for flood defences as part of a plan to become greener. More than half of the organisation's CO2 emissions come from the construction of flood defences. It estimates the move to low-carbon concrete could help reduce them by up to 45%. One of Leeds' most popular cycling routes has been resurfaced using recycled waste material. Volvo has teamed up with plastic road company McReber and Leeds City Council to improve the journey for cyclists travelling from the city centre to the Yorkshire Dales. Potholes along Harrogate Road have been filled in using 850 kilograms of recycled plastic waste. That's the equivalent of 170,000 supermarket carrier bags. And a blossom garden is opening in East London that's dedicated to the people who've died of coronavirus. 33 blossom trees, one for each of the city's boroughs, have been planted inside the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park in Stratford. It's part of a wider campaign to bring nature to cities and give more people access to green spaces. Now, it's not only what we do on our planet which makes a difference to climate change. Today, the government announced plans to allow satellite and rocket launches from commercial spaceports in the UK. Space exploration allows scientists to better understand everything from extreme weather to global warming, water cycles and air quality, but getting there has a significant environmental impact. Launching a spaceship into orbit is thought to emit nearly as much carbon dioxide equivalent as five return transatlantic flights. But rocket launches are still rare, so that figure doesn't compare to the more than a billion tonnes of carbon dioxide produced each year by the aviation industry. The bigger problem is the damage done to the atmosphere itself by rocket launches. And it's not just carbon dioxide that's the issue. Burning rocket fuel deposits chemicals, including chlorine, into the atmosphere. Now, chlorine destroys the ozone molecules that shield the planet from the sun's rays. Black carbon and aluminium oxide are also deposited. Now, the soot particles absorb sunlight and heat up the air around it, and the aluminium oxide particles reflect heat away. So together, these two effects make the surface of the planet cooler, but keep the atmosphere warmer. And as the upper atmosphere warms up, the chemical reactions that deplete the ozone layer happen even faster. Well, joining me now is Sasha Dairy, founder and chief executive of Blue Shift Aerospace, who've developed a new sustainable rocket fuel. Uh, welcome to you. So rocket launches, as we saw there, clearly have a, a big environmental impact. But how helpful can space exploration be in learning about the impacts of climate change? Well, it's certainly small satellites are being used even today to examine the Earth's atmosphere and effects of global climate change. Uh, and as you all know, uh, our fuel is one that is uh, very close to net carbon zero. Uh, and not all fuels and not all rocket engines, including our own, emit the same chemicals that you referred to. For instance, ours does not emit chlorine or uh, or aluminum particles, aluminum oxide, but there, you know, certainly it's very difficult to admit, uh, not admit things like carbon uh, as you go up, uh, as you punch through the atmosphere. So I think, you know, rocket companies have got to look at ways of becoming more and more responsible, and we're doing our best to, to get there. And aside from fuel, what else can be done to, to minimize the environmental impact? 
Well, you know, I think there, you know, there's things about how you burn your rocket engines, how how cleanly you burn them, how much soot comes off of them. You mentioned uh, early on about the emission of carbon uh, particles, and I think that that depends a lot on how the engines burned. So uh, a lot of rocket companies, including our, including our own, need to tweak our engines to be sure that we emit very little in the way of actual soot, and it's a very clean burn. This actually optimizes our engine and benefit for us. Uh, the other things you can do is look at you know what you are doing for launches, looking for ways to offset the the carbon production that you have, uh, whether it's planting trees or uh, incentivizing uh, your customers to also um, ensure that they're using propellants and green methodologies for uh, their research and their launch uh, launch of their satellites. Sasha Derry, really interesting to hear. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you very much, Anna. Now, earlier this year, Waitrose promised to stop selling children's magazines containing disposable toys. The inspiration? 10-year-old Sky Neville, who's campaigning to ban plastic toys from kids' publications. In the latest of our Climate Diaries, Sky explains what inspired her to take a stand. Hi, my name is Sky, and I'm 10 years old. I live in beautiful Snowdonia National Park in North Wales, and my interests are rock climbing. My campaign started when I started subscribing to magazines. Some magazines came in a paper envelope, unwrapped, or in a potato starch bag, all environmentally friendly. But some came with, like this, with a plastic wrapper, plastic blister packaging, and free gifts, like a squishy eyeball. So I wrote to the publishers, and they responded back with not a great response. So I started a petition online and shared on social media. 10 days later, Waitrose has stopped selling comics with plastic toys on the front. I hope all retailers can do the same and then the publisher can realise this is not acceptable anymore. There is no planet B. Well, that's everything from us for today. Coming up next time, we're looking at biomass and whether it should really be classed as a renewable energy source. You can find out more here on The Daily Climate Show at the same time tomorrow. Thanks for watching. See you then.